death taxes and a World Cup every four years. These are the truisms soccer fans have held dear since time immemorial. However, now the big wigs and decision makers at FIFA want to up the frequency of the globe's biggest sporting event to once every two years. I'm joined by Tariq Panja of the New York Times, Rob Harris of the Associated Press, and our own Jimmy Conrad of 2006 World Cup fame to discuss the World Cup's governing body's attempts to push through a biennial World Cup. Que golazo begins right now. Hey, everybody. Welcome to Que Golazo. Thank you so much for being part of the family. Thanks for tuning in. Leave us a comment, like the video, push that notification bell, and you will get all the latest episodes. We're on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, CBS Sports, and your CBS Sports app. Right then, as I mentioned in the intro, something fishy is going on with FIFA. When isn't it, by the way? But today we discuss about these plans from the World Cup FIFA body to try and see if they do it once every two years. I couldn't answer this myself. I'm not smart enough or good enough. I needed a good team, and I'm so happy to first welcome uh, our very own Jimmy Conrad. Jimmy, how are you, buddy? I'm very good. I'm very excited to talk to these very intelligent gentlemen about this very interesting topic, so this should be a lot of fun. It should be a lot of fun. And uh, absolutely, we brought in the big guns. First of all, let's welcome in. We're going to welcome in by, you know, who came to the taping first. All right. So, <laughs> Tariq Panja from the New York Times. Tariq, how are you, buddy? Oh, I'm very good. I just want to thank Jimmy for getting up so early to, to deal with this. Appreciate that, mate. Yeah, no but, problem. I'm excited. Listen, he gets paid enough to do it. So don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> just kidding. We always appreciate Jimmy getting up early. And last but not least, Rob Harris from the Associated Press. Rob, how are you, my friend? Oh, good. Good to join you. Good to spot those World Cup posters behind you. You might need a few more of them in the coming years. Or not, <laughs> I, maybe. Yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah, I might need a bigger wall if the plans uh, go to uh, plan. But thank you so much, everybody, for being uh, part of this. As I mentioned, today's a discussion about FIFA's plans to make the World Cup once every two years. And part of the conversation today is we wanted, obviously, as Jimmy mentioned, some really smart, great reporters that know everything about this conversation. Uh, and I include Jimmy Conrad in that because as well he can offer not just you know a, a reporting perspective but an actual playing perspective having played in a world cup of course representing the united states uh all right so the first thing i want to do here gentlemen is uh strike you know we obviously have read a lot i want to kind of set the scene uh for everybody watching and listening so Tariq, i want to begin with you first of all this isn't really something new, right? Like this idea of trying to make the World Cup more frequent. But why were FIFA pushing the idea of a biennial World Cup so suddenly and aggressively, so recent? In terms of suddenly and aggressively, I think that speaks to the temperament, really, of the current president, Gianni Infantino, a man who has an idea and pushes it as fast as he can to try and get it done. It's only a couple of years ago where he sort of emerged into a meeting of the FIFA Council, which is its board for those who aren't familiar with FIFA. Um, 20, 26, 27 members. He, it was in Bogota, in Colombia, in, in 2018. He, he just appeared with a document in his hand and he whacked it down on the table in front of everyone. And he said, look, I've had this $25 billion offer from I can't tell you who because I've signed an NDA. <laughs> and I've got 60 days to get this done. Give me your signature. And it's for a Club World Cup. And, you know, if you're a reasonable member of a board with some fiduciary responsibilities, you're probably going to say, hey, man, you might want to give us some more information about this. Um, it led to which, you know, this longstanding war, which is what it is with UEFA, because UEFA's president, Alexander Cheferin, saw that as a threat to his Champions League. And this is where we are. Gianni comes up with an idea, and, and this, this issue of a, a biennial World Cup was mooted by the Saudi Arabian Federation at a FIFA Congress as though it came out of left field, as though it was their idea. But it, it's clear this is the idea of the FIFA hierarchy, and, and much like in the Set Blatter era, you, you, you select a, a kind of pliant federation, an ally to, to float a balloon, a balloon that you've pretty much inflated yourself and then off we go. We're off to the races. And again, he seems to be in a real hurry to get this done by the end of the year. And, and you know, confederation presidents I've spoken to around the world seem to be wondering, it may or may not be a good idea, but why are we doing this so fast? It, this is, uh, you know, this man's style in many ways. Yeah. 
Rob, I wanted you to chime in for a second because uh, as as Tariq is explaining in terms of, you know, it's setting the scene regarding to the Bayern World Cup, I, I was wondering, is the organization strapped for cash? You know, is there obviously the overall consensus right now is thinking it's a money thing. Is Do you feel that that is the way that it's going? Is there something more behind it? I think it's very much a legacy proposition from Gianni Infantino and also wanting to have greater control of the world football, to have a tournament every single year because a biennial World Cup would mean a men's or women's World Cup every single year, which suddenly makes FIFA a lot more important. And on top of that, a club World Cup potentially that is still trying to get through as well. It was already due to launch this year, but the pandemic and the lack of financing, financing so it really stop those plans going ahead. So I think we look at it in terms of Gianni Fantino wanting to elevate his own status, his own power. He obviously presents it as trying to help the growth of the game, the development of nations, more chances for teams to get involved in playing in a World Cup. Although mm. there's less evidence that just because you have a World Cup more often means you're suddenly going to get a lot more teams qualifying already. The tournament is expanding to 48 teams from 2026, which creates an all sorts of lopsided issues with the format with a three-team group stage and I think a lot of this is just questions over the process how he's come about to reach this point it was you know 2018 that this was first being floated by the uh, Commonwealth president Alexandra Dominguez and that th those plans dropped then uh, and Dominguez couldn't get them through and FIFA didn't seem to pursue them much then Infantino revived it in the sense of a Women's World Cup every two years. He brought that up at the Women's World Cup in 2019. And yet this very much has been a very male-focused issue for now for FIFA. They have brought the women's side of the game on board much later on in this process. Yeah, I was going to say that with regard to Rob's point, I hadn't taken the legacy angle into consideration. So that's an interesting take on this. For me, it's it's control and money. I, I feel like if you look back at the, the, the numbers I'm seeing being reported, UEFA makes $11 billion over four years because they have the Euros and they have the Champions League and everything that falls under their umbrella. FIFA over four years of that same four-year period makes $4 billion. And, and majority of it comes in from the World Cup year and the other years are kind of struggling. So I can understand why this plan's been put in place because to Rob's point and what Tariq said before, there's just not enough action going on with FIFA. They want to they want to make sure that they're relevant. And, and I think that's uh, really important to know. And, and I don't know if this phrase is exactly right, but follow the money, I think, is the, is the right uh, phrase with regard to some of the decision making here. And, and, or at least that's how it feels. So I'm curious uh, about this, not only from a sporting side, and I think that's a whole big conversation about we're now basically looking at players as robots, but but also with regard to What's really happening here? And it just feels like a pissing match between the UEFA and FIFA. Yeah. Um, so let's, 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 let's move here for a second. I, I want to ask something. Uh, let, let me be the devil's advocate. Okay. Is it... Uh, wait, you're the Sepp Blatter advocate? Is that what you're... <laughs> <laughs> let me be the Peruvian Sepp Blatter for a second, which is uh, kind of scary if you think about it. But let me go back to you, Tariq, for a second. Uh, would this be really unpopular, do you think? Like, if, if, if it actually went to vote, I know that there's obviously meant to be, uh, at the very least, a consultation meeting in December, et cetera. Would, th would this idea, you know, be uh, unpopular as you think? Or do you think that it actually can gain a little traction? I think it's gained a lot of traction, again, but not for the right reasons, perhaps. Um, we we want to maybe think about how these decisions are arrived at, what needs to happen. So it doesn't matter what, what you know, Rob Harris, uh, Luis, Jimmy Conrad, what we think, you know, it doesn't matter what the coaches think. It does, it's amazing. It doesn't matter what the players think. The only people that have a say in this process are 211 national soccer associations. And essentially, most of them uh, generate almost all of their money from handouts, whether it's from FIFA or from their regional bodies. So you're asking a bunch of old men, I'm going to say that because they are, it's factual, um, do you want more money? And often in any sort of politics, pure pork barrel politics as this is, you're going to say, yeah, sure, where do I sign? So it's not about a, a World Cup or opportunity maybe you know in some cases it might be but the the idea is often with these fas that they're going to get more 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 money and then you know 
to Jimmy's point, yeah, it is about money. But then we got to look back. You say, look, FIFA is getting six and UEFA is getting 11. But what does FIFA do with this money? Right. Well, what's the point of this money, right? It's not a... It's not got. It's not a private company. It's not got um like um a rich investor who's looking to make a profit from this. So the, the the reason of FIFA to exist is to develop the game of football around the world, and it does so by by hosting this extremely popular event, right? Um, which is I think more popular than the the Summer Olympics, which is going some. It's the most popular sporting event on the planet. Where is this money going? So then, if I'm at FIFA. If I'm Gianni Infantino, new broom comes in after the scandal of 2015. Sepp Blatter's gone. He hasn't changed anything. He's only arguably made the system even more kind of, you know, tipped from the president down and that, you know, they all have to kind of genuflect towards him because he quadrupled the handout right. to, to these national federations. Now, let me ask you this. Why does England need a FIFA handout in the same way as, I don't know, a, a country with a large population somewhere in, in Africa that needs more, more of FIFA's money, more grassroots action? Every nation, San Marino, will get the same as, uh, I don't know, Congo. The, the population and the needs are completely different. But in order for the politics, one member, one vote, this is, this is how it's been. So when we're thinking about Gianni looking at the legacy of his own legacy and restructuring football, it might have been, I think, really important had they restructured FIFA, both from a decision-making point of view and what they do with all of this money. Because giving the same amount to the same country doesn't really sound like much difference to what Blatter did and what Havelange did before him. No, I agree with that. And I actually wanted to ask Rob, because Tariq, you brought up the Olympics. How does that impact that competition? Because I saw that they're pissed... Rob, about what's happening with FIFA because now it's going to impact their little four-year cycle in terms of when they have their events. Do you have any insight on, on that little beef between the Olympics and FIFA? Yeah, that was quite incredible intervention from the International Olympic Committee. We're used to quite dry statements from them in terms of not really getting involved. In fact, just before this, in the weeks beforehand, they said they wouldn't even comment on this issue. Then suddenly on a Saturday evening after an executive board meeting, they came out against these plans talking about the impact on other sports as well on their world championships that take place each year and also the impact on the women's game too because you know if, if there was a men's world cup every year the arsene wenger plan is for a uh, continental championship in the alternate years so no longer would the odd numbers years be the preserve of uh, women's tournaments be it from uh, you know fifa or from uh, the continental bodies in the women's game and also if this plan did come to fruition and both the men's and women's game had tournaments every single year in June, July, well, of course, the Olympics drops in June, in July and August. And for the women's game, it's currently age unrestricted. So yeah. there'd be significant questions about the uh, participation of teams in that. And I actually asked Jill Ellis about this a few weeks ago when she did a FIFA media call. And she actually just criticised the Olympic format instead, saying 12 teams really isn't enough. You, you know, European top sides do miss out um, in, in the current guys. Uh, you know, the, the way European qualifying is determined currently through the World Cup means, uh, you know, teams can miss out that way. So it's a big ticket seller as well for the IOC, the Olympic football. You know, when I was checking back for the empty stadium Olympics in Japan, how many tickets they sold in um, Brazil? I think it was averaging over 30,000 a game. So pretty significant for them. But also, obviously, a lot of self-interest in this. You see quite close alliance between uh, UEFA and um, the IOC as well, perhaps, in sort of getting this uh, statement of opposition. But we'll probably get to it. And the heart of it, the fact is, we're talking about the end product of what needs to be a sort of review of how international football is. One solution that FIFA wants, biennial World Cups. There are clear legitimate issues. The rest of the, the way the global game is structured, qualifying both in the uh, the men's and the women's game in terms of more meaningful fixtures, fewer sort of stop-start breaks for international breaks, but it's all become caught up instead in the desired end goal of FIFA by any of World Cups. Yeah, and the, the problem is, is now you also have the added avalanche of the fact that we're dealing with this uh, during a pandemic, which obviously, you know, if you want to say Jimmy's point about follow the money, obviously the financial necessities during a COVID-19 situation is extra key. Tariq, Arsene Wenger, 
Okay, I feel that he entered this literally his first interview at FIFA was just like, look, we know what you've done. Uh, we know how smart you are with the game. This is literally your only job. I want you to sell this. That, that's what it feels like. So what was Arsene Wenger's role in this idea and what were his and other FIFA ambassadors, you know, doing in order to make this happen? Because obviously he's been the poster boy, so to speak, for this uh, situation. Yeah, he'll also be the guy who gets hit by the truck when it goes up in flames as well, exactly. right? Still cover. right. Yeah. Uh, really, for me, it's quite an unfortunate position for, for him to find himself in. Uh, you know, football fans of a certain age, you know, we a huge amount of respect for Arsene Wenger. So what he did at Arsenal, change, in Premier League in general, he changed the entire culture of a footballing culture in a, in a, in a nation, in a very um, soccer-mad nation like England. For this guy from France, Arsene who he was called when he first arrived from from Japan, and, and you know he he will go down as a real important figure in in the game, regardless. So he 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 obviously, and he he loves he loves football. The guy is obsessed with football. You know his if you ask him what his hobby is when he's not you know when he wasn't coaching, it was watching football on TV. I'm not sure it'd be like the, you know the most fun on a night out in that case. But, <laughs> but there you go. You know, but but. So he's got the he's got the heft. This is this is yeah. the man, and this is what you know. He's like a shield for this idea. You know, every time I ask someone, I remember talking to someone at FIFA about this, and they were like, "Well, how can you argue with Arsene Wenger?" And that was <laughs> like whatever happens. So you know, Arsene, you know, the, the, you know, God from the Mount of Football, you know, Arsene has spoken. He must never be questioned. This, this, and it seems like he is the, a fig leaf for this for this process. Now, I have I have a suspicion that this isn't his idea at all. Um, as, as Rob kind of alluded to, the biennial World Cup is part of a broader conversation about the future of football, which is the next ten years. What does the football calendar look like? And everyone's trying to plant their flag with you know. Club World Cups. We had the Super League um, idea. It's not. It's no surprise it came now um, with, with this this issue up in up in the air. The new Champions League formats there. So they keep using Arsenal. And then one thing Gianni did from from way way back when is he got this collection of FIFA legends, yeah, um, <laughs> who who fly around the world and and essentially tell the the good news story on behalf of FIFA you know these yeah, are I remember the photo the fo it was like a school photo and you saw all those like Alexi Lalas was part of it obviously uh you know uh Peter Schmeichel was there like, there were like, a lot right. it was a big school photo I remember that <laughs> and the thing the thing with these legends is they all this is very odd they all completely agree with everything FIFA has said so hey by New World Cup, I remember asking Peter Schmeichel because there was this um, uh, media briefing with um, Wenger and um, the, the the original Ronaldo. Jimmy, you may have even played against him at that, that point in your career. Um, uh, there was, yeah, Peter Schmeichel. I can't remember one one other player, and I just remember asking because I had eighty players on this in this consultation. So Peter, did did anyone disagree? No, no, I, I don't think. And I'm thinking, you know, you just go to the pub. <laughs> with anyone yeah, yeah, you can exactly. be something that we all agree on there's gonna be someone who just for the sake of it will, will, will disagree with this thing so this there's a there's a bit of optics but just to, just to close on this point there's an enormous amount of kind of re reverse engineering in the process see for me i i don't know i don't think this is a good idea but i'd like to see all the the process work to me this is seems like this is a decision that's already been taken yeah. and they're now adding these bits on now how could you ask for a vote, when you got Gianni Infantino last week saying, "Hey, if you got any good ideas, they're better than this. Can you let us know?" Two, uh, yeah, we're still putting the financial projections on. We we have, you know, we're still going to talk. Like if none of that has been done, why are certain FAs, particularly there was a fellow in Nigeria who was just crying for this thing to be done yesterday. You know, you know, man, you haven't seen all the all the projections yet. This, this 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 is like a serious, or it's supposed to be a very serious organization taking a very very important decision for the world's most popular sport. It just doesn't feel like that way. Jimmy, what do you make of the, the the chaos, really? Yeah, I think it's pretty chaotic. I'll start with the R nine Ronaldo shout. I did play against them, and it didn't go well. So we'll just leave it there. <laughs> uh, that's for a second. I want to say that it would be fun. 
if somebody started a FIFA fan TV channel so that they could start flying banger out banners out around FIFA headquarters just so we could have a little bit of fun and actually get into these guys and hold them accountable. Because I feel like that's what gets the views. That's what gets the clicks is all this negativity around when things aren't going right, especially as it pertains to Arsene Wenger. Arsenal fan TV people know all about that. So there's that kind of interest where we can hold them accountable in some ways outside of them kind of just trying to, to grease the wheels and pay everybody off to make sure they say all the right things. What I find interesting is that one, that Arsene Wenger would even agree to be the puppet with regard to this without having some sense of belief. I mean, money's money, and I'm sure he already had plenty of it. So I'm, I'm very curious as to – I think he's trying to do, at least it feels like it, what's right for the game. And he's talking about having less international breaks. Qualifying windows will happen twice a year only, so it's not really impacting or interfering with the flow of club football for, for too long. I'm interested to hear a little bit more about what that looks like. But to your point, Tariq, this next 10 years is going to be – quite fascinating with regard to how things are going to change and so rob i'm going to throw it to you because i want to talk about it seems like they're just trying to create this real estate we need more real estate so that we can leverage that real estate to make more money that's how it feels to me and if we have a world cup every two years a women's world cup every two years we have all these club world cups then that will give us that opportunity to start to take a little bit more control whereas it feels like uefa is starting to gain more and more and more of it yeah, and I think UEFA feels more of a threat in that regard. Obviously, the, 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 the value of the European Championship would be potentially diminished, as would the World Cup if it did go every two years for the men. I do think there is more of a case for the women's game to actually have a more frequent World Cup. Yes, it would then create a disparity mm -hmm. in terms of the men's game, in terms of them both not following the same cycles. But perhaps the alternative is the creation of some additional events because already that happens in the women's game with the She Believes Cup in the States, usually in March. England is creating its own friendly tournament effectively in February next year. So we are seeing perhaps different challenges in the men's and women's games. England have won two of their most recent qualifiers, 10 nil. Obviously great for the players in terms of racking up scoring uh, totals for the overall tallies, but competitive-wise, not really so. Doesn't really drive the improvement of the team. Doesn't help their opposition potentially as well if they're being um, so heavily beaten like that and so out of touch in the game. So potentially because they're on different growth trajectories, the men's and women's game does need a sort of different analysis over which tournaments are required and what the future is for them. Uh, and that's why FIFA say they're brought in Jill Ellis, although she was only brought in after Arsene Wenger spent many, many months already looking at these plans. And, you know, as we look at this, what is forgotten in this process is it's not necessarily about tournaments. FIFA's made up out of that. It's the international match calendar because yeah. the women's one ends in 2023 as it stands. The men's agreement ends in 2024. So what there is actually agreement needed between, for instance, the national federations, the club bodies in terms of setting up the structure of the international football year in the coming years ahead. And what the international match calendar does, it determines when clubs have to release their players to their uh, national teams for international duty. And then, you know, with the European Club Association and FIFA, for instance, there's all sorts of compensation packages in place. So clubs get cash for their players featuring in uh, major tournaments, for instance. So that is also needed. So a lot of discussions are being conflated into one. The new international match calendar, what should qualifying look like? How many international windows should there be in the year? How many World Cups should there be? How frequent should they be? Because... I think if we look at particularly qualifying as it is now in the international windows, which are in um, March, June, July for tournaments, September, October, November in the men's game. Well, I think those September, October, November ones particularly, perhaps it's two stop start. Vegas proposing just one big window outside of the major tournament one, but maybe it would benefit from just two in the autumn, uh, or Northern Hemisphere autumn, or the fall, <laughs> or... or, or or, or indeed just one and then another in March. Though one, you know, Wenger's thinking about scrapping the March one as well, which denies opportunities for players to break into the national teams. Mm -hmm. If a player is injured around October, November, then they might completely miss out on all qualifiers and impact the chance of their country qualifying. And also, if you cram all the fixtures together, it can, it can damage revenue for countries as well because there might be less demand for tickets if you're just suddenly playing every qualifier at the same time. And that's particularly impactful for the smaller federations too. 
Yeah, there is so much to uh, break down here. And I, I actually want to, in a second, really discuss as well, just a player's perspective. And that's really what I really want to hear because we've talked a lot about scheduling, logistics and stuff. But how does a player feel about all of this? We're going to take a break. Kego Lasso will take a break. When we, uh, when we come back, we'll discuss much, much more with Tariq Panja, Rob Harris, and of course, Jimmy Conrad. Kego Lasso will be right back. Welcome back, everybody, to Kigo Lasso. We're having a great discussion here on FIFA's plans for a biennial World Cup. Tariq Panja, Rob Harris, Jimmy Conrad. Right then, we've talked a lot about, you know, the plans from FIFA, the plans or acceptances or not acceptances from federations, uh, football associations, et cetera, et cetera. I want to know, and perhaps, uh, you know, a, a deeper discussion, but, you know, on just a player. Just, you know, we're talking about the fact that, Forget the physical side of things, Jimmy, uh, the mental aspect as well. I mean, we already see how it affects players from uh, a COVID perspective. I'm, I'm thinking just selfishly South American-wise, just to travel that these have to do and then coming back and then being in a sort of a specific bubble. Now you're throwing in the fact that, you know, there might be a possibility of a World Cup once every two years. How would you feel? Let's say that you are in your prime, in your prime, Jimmy Conrad, and uh, the plans have been made now to do a World Cup once every two years. How would you, Jimmy, would feel about that? Okay, I'm going to answer that question. But first, I want to say that because I play in the World Cup and it being every four years, which mm. the timing of you being healthy and everything falling into place, because I was a late addition, a late bloomer to the festivities. I wasn't a kid coming out at 18 with all the sparkling hype and all that that comes with it. I had to kind of fight and earn and scratch. It made me feel really special. And now if they're going to have one every two years, it's not going to feel as special. That's what I'm going to say. So I'm <laughs> sad about that. Second, what I want to add is if I was in my prime, I guess I'd be excited about, hey, I could probably play in four World Cups now and no problem, you know? So it's interesting, the, the perspective there from that standpoint to be able to play in more World Cups because of the prestige it has, I think is a, a special feeling. That said, if it's every two years, I think it will lose a little bit of that mystique that surrounds it. So I don't know. I guess I'm kind of torn. We have to see what it looks like if it does end up going off. That said, there is there is something that that I do appreciate about getting nations together and competing at the highest levels. And I know that, and I didn't hear Tariq or Rob say it, but it just feels like it's very really thinly veiled that FIFA exists to support the game everywhere else. They say that, right? Oh, if we have more tournaments you know, like it's going to help Madagascar become good. And and I guess theoretically it could if that money gets, as Tariq said earlier, gets actually put into that infrastructure and they can actually grow in a meaningful way. But ultimately, it's still about making money. And so I, it's hard to, to take away from that. And I think players are smart enough to know what's happening here. And I'm sure they're going to ask for a bigger piece of the pie if that happens, too. So. Yeah, it's there's a lot to unpack there, Luis. There's a, uh, Jimmy, there's a funny, funny uh, curiosity actually. Maybe it's a it's a fluke, and there is no real rhyme or reason for this. It, it's just uh, when 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 it was Wenger or, or Gianni, or one of the, one of the guys supporting this said, "Oh, you know, by by playing in more tournaments, you end up having better results." And the thing is, I looked at African teams because I look at Africa a lot with FIFA because FIFA essentially for the last year or so has taken over African football. Uh, that's for another show, perhaps. <laughs> but um, And they've got worse. I remember as a kid, that Cameroon team in 1990, mm -hmm. that should have knocked England out in the quarterfinal. Yeah, they were. What a revelation. Amazing. Also, you learn about geography as a, as, as a kid with these, mm -hmm. before the internet, really. So you, Cameroon is, was that. And that Cameroon team, uh, sorry to interrupt her, it was essentially the reason why Pele started saying, you know, uh, an African team is going to win the World Cup and so and so or whatever. There was like this narrative now being built, right? Yeah, so you, you had them. Really, they should have got to the semifinal. And then after that, who knows what what could happen? You know, a couple of games of football, um, and then you have the odd. You had the odd, you had Ghana in 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 South Africa, but for the uh, infamous Luis Suarez handball, and then the the missed penalty from Asamo Jan, I think uh, they they would have made a, a semi final as well. But the, but you know, taken together, African f football uh, teams at World Cups have gotten worse. The more, the more they've played. So that that necessarily doesn't necessarily speak to the point that they're trying to say. You know, you get to this tournament, you're going to get better. It's probably more about the right investment in the right places, 
and also people actually wanting to play football, right? Um, conditions, environment, etc. You know, so 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 I, I don't know if that that necessarily is a thing. And from a, a player's point of view, I think it was on your station or one of your affiliates. We had Thierry Henry with CBS, I think, where he 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 spoke about, look. I am tired after tournaments, and I'm not just physically tired. I am mentally finished. Yeah. You've got a tough, especially for these elite players. The amount of pressure every weekend of football, be it in the Premier League and Serie A, even the Brasileiro in in, in Brazil, um, the, the 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 media scrutiny, every point counts. The pressure on your place, and then not having a summer off ever. And then wearing the, the shirt, the heaviest shirt often is the national team shirt. And then doing it again and again. These, you know, Jimmy, I think you use a word. These aren't robots. Are they? Yeah. I mean, you, do you ever feel like that? No, I just wanted to jump in and say that it's interesting you bring that up about the emotional and Thierry Henry saying that after a tournament. Because when I look back at my 2006 experience, for me, I accomplished everything I set out to do in my life. I overachieved. I never thought I'd play in a World Cup. I dreamed about it, but I never thought I would. And I got there and I held my own. And it wasn't our greatest performance collectively, but it was a thrill for me. And I got to prove to, to the haters out there and to myself that I could, in fact, do it. And I came back and I was, I didn't know what to do. Like, what's now? I have to wait four more years. To, I guess two years would have been nice. I would have stayed motivated. But four more years to, to, to you know, stay on top of it and, and to stay sharp. And I was 29 at the time. Am I going to be looked at, uh, you know, the wrong side of 30 and damaged goods? I, I came back a little depressed. I went back to my club team three days, four days after getting knocked out because I didn't know what else to do. And I was that type of player, wanted to be there. I got that hero complex like a lot of us. And and I, I played poorly. We lost three to two. And, and I broke my jaw the next game. And actually getting my jaw broken by Clint Dempsey. Thanks, Clint. I got to rest. I got to rest for eight weeks. Because yeah. my jaw was wired shut and it was the best thing that ever happened to me because I could have that time to decompress from everything that I was working through. So, yeah, from an emotional standpoint, Thierry Henry is spot on. And the fact that we're not allowing any breaks or time for these players to rest, both physically, emotionally, and, and yeah, I guess those two, then then it's going to be hard, I think, to maybe hit those gears. But that maybe plays into what Rob was saying earlier, that maybe this will give more opportunity to players that it doesn't look like will get those opportunities otherwise. <laughs> And I think that was particularly the point that when we were hearing from Thierry on the other way of the week on uh, Paramount, which was you had Peter Schmeichel in the studio with him. And he was obviously they're talking about Arsene Wenger's plan for a mandatory 25 day break after every tournament, which Wenger believed then, well, that would clear the mind. Thierry Henry was saying, actually, it'd be challenging enough in the current cycle when he was a player recovering mentally from from that uh, focus intense planning and and playing in the tournaments and then you had jamie carragher alongside him pointing out he'd had a conversation with arsene wenger about these plans and he hadn't heard back from him recently he hadn't been invited onto another call and uh, <laughs> suggested that might be because he was uh, not too uh, en enamored with it and not too supportive and that comes back to the earlier point about all the people presented by fifa are so in favor of this uh, proposition and right. their point was also why is it not current players being consulted? We're not hearing uh, FIFA consulting them. They all say they're consulting FIFA, the players' union, but FIFA are happy enough to distance themselves from FIFA <laughs> at other times. And perhaps many of the players we are hearing from are a lot more sceptical. And some have surprised me, like uh, Gareth Bale as Wales captain. He's never had the chance to play in a World Cup. He's been to the, the one Euros in 2016, reaching the semi-final so unexpectedly. You'd think a player like Bale would be the first to be desperate to get a World Cup every two years, a Euros every two years, to have many chances as possible to qualify. But, you know, even someone like he, he is against it too. So, um, you know, just hearing from around the game, there is that significant scepticism from the current coach as well, like... Didier Deschamps at France, we've got Roberto Martinez as well in Belgium, all questioning the status of it. And FIFA does try to present a lot of it as being Europe against the rest of the world. It's Europe denying the progress of African nations, Asian nations, you know, North American nations, having the chance to to develop more and to, to get more chances at World Cup. But, you know, there's no real sense of any sort of widespread support from people within the game, apart from perhaps those federations with closer alliances to uh, FIFA and uh, you know that's something that's been particularly noteworthy during this. 
All right. So let me bring this back all the way around and let's go back now to the present. Uh, Tariq, I want you to answer me this and then Rob, please feel free to to jump in as well. Where are we right now? Is it, you know, is it still, you know, is it, do you think it's, it's, it's calming down? I think I remember reading a tweet from you, Tariq, that maybe things are, you know, quieting down. Is it dead in the water? Are we still going on with this? Where are we right now, Tariq? I, I really think it's on life support, if not close to, because you've got to spool out a bit for consequences. You've had UEFA and you've had Comnable mm. openly talking about taking severe action. What would that action look like? You know, sometimes you think things are always going to be the same. We have FIFA, so there's always going to be FIFA. We have the World Cup, so there's always going to be a World Cup. But things can change. Now, you, if you push people so far to a point where they start thinking, you know, what else could we do? Now, if this vote takes place in December, which it will not, I'm sure it will not. And the majority of these countries, most of them who will never ever qualify for a World Cup, let's face it, you know, but no offense to Bahamas, but I'll say Bahamas or, or you know, or, 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 or you know, um, maybe Myanmar or somewhere like that. Of course, they'll vote yes. And there's more of them than there are that qualify for the World Cup. So then that's on the board. There's a biannual World Cup. What if, and it's possible, UEFA and Comabol, and we say Comabol, South American football, we're talking about Brazil, Argentina, and Peru. Thank you so much for that, Tariq. <laughs> <laughs> they, they come together and say, hey, why don't we have a tournament? Why don't we host it in the summer? How about June and July? Us European teams, you South American teams, and hey, we might have some invite spots as well, five or six, maybe ten. Hey, United States, Japan, would you like to play? Yeah, this is a good point, yeah. And then you've gone. There is no law that says FIFA has to exist. It will cause absolute chaos. But when you push people right to the brink, you are opening an entire can of worms. And then you are, you are, you are out, you've lost control. In terms of legacy, I'm not sure anyone would want to be the FIFA president who presided over the end of FIFA. It was almost set blatter. Maybe it's Gianni Infantino this time. Yeah, I mean, it's quite interesting sort of having particularly heard from the European FAs in the last week or so. And there was definitely a real threat from within Europe to potentially quit FIFA. And whether or not it, ha it does actually happen, who knows? But the conversation is definitely taking place about how to trigger potentially the mechanism to, uh, to quit FIFA. And you could say maybe at some you know, it is groups of nations together helping UEFA's cause in terms of taking on FIFA. But actually, ultimately, you know, the, the question of value of what FIFA is actually needed for. The laws of the game are actually set by IFAB, which is only half controlled by FIFA in terms of the votes. And then, you know, you don't have to be a member of FIFA to be a member of a confeder uh, confederation, for instance. You know, Gibraltar was a member of UEFA before it was a member of FIFA. So... It's, it's, it's only an umbrella organisation at the top of things. It's not the, the, the most significant necessarily at all times. And you see this repeatedly with FIFA trying to antagonise UEFA seemingly as well. And they sort of get into these battles. They had it over the Club World Cup, mentioned over that $25 billion offer that was on the table a few years ago. That so infuriated members of the FIFA Council, particularly Europe, when they were effectively given a fait accompli to go and agree to it. Eventually, UEFA did relent and in 2019 did agree to an expanded Club World Cup, 24 teams every four years rather than the current little regarded 17 annual tournament. And, you know, they did have plans for that, as we said earlier, for, for this year, but they did um, sort of fall away, as it were. But it is still on the table. UEFA did drop their opposition to it. And one of the other perhaps interlinked issues in all this is still the many suspicions around the world of football about just how much FIFA were involved in the European Super League planning in terms of whether they got the impression from the elite clubs that they actually did have some backing from Gianni Infantino and FIFA if they did eventually go ahead with it. Uh, obviously, as it quickly sort of fell apart, that's when you heard Infantino being very vocally um, opposing to it in, in public. But obviously, that's an area that heavily scrutinized as well and just in terms of the motivations of FIFA in taking on UEFA and that 
Yeah, I, I, I love the insight here from Tariq and Rob. I, I really appreciate you guys coming on. I saw an idea from another one of our friends, journalist Michael Cox, about how the fact that there's only two two continents that have won the World Cup, South America and Europe. So you could allow them, potentially, if you wanted to find a compromise here, where they could continue to do their Euros and, and Copa America in those every two years. But and for everybody else, because... CONCACAF Gold Cup here, Mexico and the U.S. have won it the last 11 times combined. Canada was the last country outside of those two to win it back in 2000. New Zealand, Australia kind of dominate Oceania, and, uh, or New Zealand in particular, and, and then they get to the World Cup and they don't do a lot, right? I mean, they've kind of hit that ceiling. This is they qualify for World Cup and then that's it. Congratulations. You made it to the group stage and didn't score any goals. Awesome for you guys. So, so I think there's a possibility where you could have all the other – continents involved and then they play in something like an intercontinental playoff that fifa can name whatever the hell they want and you still allow the euros which is obviously incredibly popular and and same with copa america to exist and maybe allow these other tournament or another tournament to flourish now i don't know how Concacaf would feel about that because then they start to lose a little bit of power and we know this is a big power game so i, I wonder about that but it would be kind of cool to see potentially japan versus mexico in the final of a big intercontinental tournament which we probably will never get in a world cup also i'm still strongly opposed to 48 teams and if you allowed uh in 2026 i do think to your early point rob that it's just it's going to be weird the format's going to be weird and though it's cool to see mozambique or whatever come in and play they're going to get stomped on and i don't know how much fun that is for anybody either so i feel like if you had this intercontinental tournament that allowed these other places to flourish and maybe bring them in there then you could continue to stay at 32 teams for the World Cup moving forward. So I think there's some compromises here, and I thought that was an interesting idea from Michael Cox. Yeah, it's, I mean, yeah, go ahead. Sorry, sorry, guys. I mean, no one's saying that FIFA shouldn't innovate. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Right. Like that, that is the job, in a way, is to come up with ways to make the game interesting. I mean, for me, as a, as a viewer as well, I, I must say, until there's a tournament on, I find the, the current calendar just... Uh, outrageously boring and quite irritating, <laughs> if I'm honest. Like, uh, you know, for this this season in particular, you had a global pandemic, which meant fans have been locked out for a year and a half of seeing their clubs, more or less, right? There was a give or take a few thousand here or there. Then this huge buildup of excitement after, from a European perspective, because it's where Rob and I are based, where you've had the Euros, quite successful, and then finally, the European club season is about to get underway. And after three games, or bang, stop. We've got these qualification matches. Yeah. And they could be hideously lopsided. It could be, you know, I don't know, a, a giant against a minnow, someone playing against Andorra or San Marino. And you're like, well, no disrespect to those countries. Good for them that they, they get to play at Wembley or, at, um, you know, in, in, in Madrid or elsewhere. But God, it just isn't good for the game. No one cares about about that, really. And fee and that's where I think Arsene Wenger is, 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 is yep, the right thing, you know, on the right thing, sorry, that something needs to happen to create, as a journalist here, I'll say something to create a narrative. We always love a good story, but then, you know, you, you can't get a good story in, in, in two days, really, and then there's a six-month, three-month break, and then another two-game start. So, mm -hmm. you know, and then the other... The other innovation that's being discussed is a potential global nations league. We, we have nations league now in, in, in Europe, in UEFA and in CONCACAF. Um, they're okay. They're, 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 you know, you have a, a, a finals and a trophy to play for and maybe in time um, they'll be, um, you know, valued a bit more. But, but the idea that some people have had and, had and started to openly discuss is why don't the other confederations have uh, their own nations leagues and that feeds into a global finale in the end something that might be interesting to both viewers to to sponsors to players no that that's a good idea Tariq it sounds like a cup of the world sort of uh... <laughs> <laughs> I just, it's a, I just, I just think that the one uh, a World Cup once every two years is a band aid over a gunshot wound problem. I think the bigger issue is trying to rectify the calendar and strengthen these regions that really need more infrastructure, more help. That's obviously a much more complex, longer project. But to everybody's point here, you know, 
FIFA needs to innovate. And, you know, I think, Tariq, you said it right at the beginning. The, the You know, what when we continue to have an organization like FIFA being ruled by, I think you can say, you know, uh, older white men who really are kind of like pretty much out of, uh, you know, reach when it comes to what the modern game needs. And this is just going to continue. Before uh, we finish, by the way, because I, I want to thank Jimmy, Rob, Tariq, just an unbelievable conversation. So good. Uh, I wanted final thoughts, just anything that you had in mind that we haven't touched on, perhaps something that you predict, something that you uh, hopefully, uh, you know, hope will happen or a- anything else. Rob, let's begin with you as we wrap up. What, what, what are you predicting here? Yeah, I think the Global Nations League is something that's more of a viable proposition because we've seen in Europe in particular the impact that the UEFA version of it has had. It's not devalued and detracted from the European Championship. It's created this tournament that creates a bit of interest, a bit of competitive edge to it. No one's too sure how to sort of judge it. It's not make or break really for teams at the moment, but it has the potential to grow with something that isn't a replica it's there that improves on the friendlies at the moment. And in normal times, you know, we see Brazil coming over to London to play friendlies. We see the United States as well, very often playing in London too. And, you know, they're making all this travel, they're playing these games. There's nothing really at stake about them. So there was a logic of perhaps the regional Nations League feeding into a uh, a global finals edition. I think if you had an all-year-round global one, it would just lead to absolutely loads of travel, which uh, particularly as <laughs> yeah. we approach COP26, the Environment Summit, wouldn't go down too well in particular. But um, I think something like a Global Nations League, which was already actually presented as a plan by UEFA about four, four or five years ago, so they've already backed it themselves as an idea. So it's not too much of an extension of that if they can sort of work harmoniously with, with FIFA to get something that is, say, a a small finals tournament with the very elite from each of the continents. And obviously there'd be so many debates about how many uh, places then you would have from each continent because there would be a desire, obviously, for, uh, you know, to try to get some of the very best nations in there. But you do need to be globally representative probably at the same time in that. And uh, also to address this issue in terms of uh, qualifying too, because, uh, you know, a lot of qualifiers, teams go through that uh, are very routine, although probably the United States experience in the last few years, qualifiers that can seem routine actually present a lot more jeopardy than, than you can possibly imagine. Too You're soon, opening right? that wound, Rob. <laughs> <laughs> Too soon. <laughs> Go ahead, Tariq. Give us your final thoughts. This might be a bit of listener repellent, but, uh, you know, I'd use the word governance here. And for, for me, if, I think we're at a point where some of these organizations must not exist in the current form. I'm talking about FIFA here. The conflicts of interest are just astronomical. This is an organization that is a competitor, really, to leagues and clubs. Let's, it is an event organizer. It's taking sponsors. It's, it's, it's taking broadcast dollars with its World Cup. So we saw it very recently. We had three games for the South American um, World Cup qualifiers which meant there was 13 days of player release required. Rob mentioned they've got an understanding with leagues and clubs for a 10-day player release. What do they do? Yet they talked to the leagues and clubs, absolutely ignored them, and had 13 days. Why? Because it's the FIFA World Cup. And if you don't release the players, guess who's going to sanction you? Oh, it's FIFA again. Now, to me, that, that, that power imbalance needs to shift a little bit because it seems unfair my final thought is you should break these organizations down. There's an event organizing company that does a World Cup. There's a disciplinary organization that governs football's laws and rules. Um, and there is a development body that does what it says in the tin, that develops football for the sake of developing football, yeah. not for another vote in an election. Yeah, just what I wanted to say outside of spending some tremendous time here with Rob and Tariq and, of course, you, LME. My favorite part, I think, is trying to name as many small nations as we could. I love that competition. <laughs> I want to give a shout out to Luxembourg, Liechtenstein, Nepal, uh, St. Kitts and Nevis. Like all those countries. That was my favorite part of this whole thing. Was, was, uh, me and well, well, you've got, you've got their vote, Jimmy. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> one member, one vote. Let's go. Well, I like the fact that when uh, Tariq was mentioning South American countries, he went Brazil, Argentina, and then we went Peru after that. So, you know, he gets wins every time. But I want to thank... Uh, 
Tariq Panja from the New York Times, Rob Harris from Associated Press, Jimmy Conrad from CBS Sports, our very own Jimmy. Thank you, everybody, uh, for being part of this. Rob, thank you so much, my friend. Great to join you guys. Thank you. I appreciate it. Tariq, always a pleasure, buddy. Thanks. Nice to be with you guys. Jimmy, you are a legend. Thank you so much for being here, bud. Big hugs to everybody. Thank you for listening and watching, as always. As always. Thank you, everybody, for being part of the family. Kego Lasso Pod on Twitter. Kego Lasso, YouTube.com forward slash Kego Lasso as well. CBS Sports, CBS Sports app. Leave that five-star rating and review on Apple Podcast, Spotify, Stitcher. We will see you next time. Enjoy the rest of your week. <laughs>